Hello, my friends. This is Pastor Christopher Alam at home in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I trust you're doing well. And, um, you know, yesterday we talked about, we are on the subject of the power of the blood of Jesus. And yesterday we talked about how the blood of Jesus has healed us from sickness and diseases, mental, emotional, and, and physical. And now we're going to talk about today, point number nine, that the blood of Jesus has bought the church. The blood of Jesus has bought the church. And I want to read to you from Acts 20, verse 28. It says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which you obtain with his own blood. So he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he has obtained with his own blood. Now, there's several things here that we should really pay attention to. And, uh, and you know, the thing is that firstly, it says you should pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. So he's really addressing uh, pastors, spiritual leaders, because uh, bishops, you know, in the Bible, when it says bishops, that's interchangeable with pastors. When it says bishops or elders, I'm sorry, not bishops, elders. When the Bible talks about elders, they are actually talking about pastors. And so elders and pastors are the same thing. So he's talking to leaders here, okay? Pastors and, and bishops and elders. So it says that you should pay careful attention to yourself. So firstly, we have to pay attention to ourselves, to, to our own lives, how we live our lives, uh, to our own testimony that our lives and our teaching line up and all that and to all the flock and all and to God's people in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. It says because the Holy Spirit has made you overseers and given you oversight over the people because you see we have a uh, if we are spiritual leaders and pastors like for example you know people call me Pastor Christopher Alam because I don't uh, I don't really pastor a church, but I've got hundreds of churches that I oversee. In Africa, we've got a whole movement. We've got hundreds of churches and I'm like a bishop or a pastor for pastors. And I've got all these pastors under me. So although I don't have an individual uh, congregation, people uh, call me their pastor. They look at me as their pastor because I pastor the pastors. And we've got all these churches that you know, I'm responsible for. So I'm an overseer because the Holy Spirit has made me an overseer to care for the church of God. But it says, first, I want you to notice it is, it says it is the church of God, not the church of God denomination, but the church is the church of God. It is not my church. They're not my churches. It's very dangerous when we begin to look at a church. I've seen uh, pastors who look at a church as their own kingdom, like it's their thing, you know, it's their life's work. They came and started this church and they think it belongs to them. Then their family begins to think it belongs to them. It's, it, it's the property of the family. Listen, a church does not belong to a man. It does not belong to a family. It's not, it's not family property. It's, it doesn't, it doesn't belong. Like, when, when, when I die and go to be with Jesus, this house I am in, uh, my kids will get, our kids will get the house and they will get my car. If my car is still running, they'll, all these clothes, whatever I have, I've left behind. They, they can, they will have it because, but one thing they don't inherit, they don't inherit the anointing and they don't inherit the ministry because those things, they, be, they belong to God and you have to keep your stuff and God's stuff separate. So there are things that belong to me and there are things that belong to God. So if you have a church, it's very careful that even though you have worked and you have built up the church, for example, your church building, look, you didn't pay for the church building. Now I have one friend, he has a church building, which he paid for because he was a businessman. God called him to the ministry and with his own money, he did well in business and with his own money, he bought his building. Now, of course, now he can say, this is my church, this is my building, but he doesn't. He doesn't. He says it's God's church, God's building because he gave it to the Lord. But many people, they treat the ministry, they treat the church as it is their, it is their property. 
that it belongs to them and it belongs to their family. And especially those of you in Africa, you are hearing this. You know, if, you're, if, you, if your bishop or apostle or whoever it is acts that way, that the church and everything in the church belongs to him, leave that church. Go somewhere else because it doesn't matter what you do, how much you, uh, how much you give, you're not giving unto the Lord, you're giving unto a man. Now I'm going in on, a, on, a, on a rabbit trail here, but I think this means to be said because it says, firstly it says, it is for the church of God. So the church belongs to God. And then it says, which he obtained with his own blood. The reason the church belongs to God is because Jesus bought and purchased the church with his own blood. Jesus has purchased the church with his own blood. I remember Brother Hagin's, his favorite song was the blood bought church. And it's true, the church, Jesus has purchased the church with his own blood. So it belongs to him. I remember I was doing a pastor's conference in Botswana and I had questions and answers and there was this one guy he put his hand up and I could see he was <laughs> he was upset about something and he said uh, what about sheep stealing so I so I said have people so I said why did you ask that question brother has someone be still been stealing your sheep and he said yes so I knew that <coughs> he had a problem because some people had left his church gone to another church I said, brother, uh, what about sheep stealing? Well, I'll give you the answer. I said, firstly, sheep stealing, are they stealing your sheep? He says, yes. I said, firstly, they're not your sheep. I said, if, I said, listen, they are your sheep only if you come to me and say that you were whipped and you were bruised and you were beaten and crowned with thorns and then you were nailed to a cross and that you bore their sins, you bore their diseases and then you died and they buried you and you went down to Hades and on the third day you rose up from the dead. I said, then I can say they're your sheep because you have paid for them with your own blood. But until that day when you do that and that's never going to happen, I said, those sheep belong to Jesus. They are his. You and I are privileged to be overseers. We are privileged to be shepherds of the people, but the sheep belong to to God. So I want you to understand this. This is very, very important that, <clears throat> that Jesus has purchased the church with his own blood. So now the church is not a building. It is not just a corporation. It's not an organization. It is not just a group of people who meet. The church is the body of Christ. And of course, there are local churches, but the local churches are a part of the body of Christ. But Jesus has purchased both the body, the larger body and the components of the body, which are the local churches. He has purchased them with his own blood and they belong to him and they are the church of God. Whether they're independent or assemblies of God or whatever they are, they, the church belongs to Jesus and he is the Lord over all things. And the Bible says that in all things he may be preeminent. Christ should always be preeminent. He's the most important person in the church because it is his church. He's the one who should be worshipped. He's the one who should be preached about, not politics preached from the pulpit or any man's interest or themes, whatever, but it should be Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen and his word, the word that come from the mouth of God that should be preached from the pulpit because the church belongs to God and he bought the church with his own blood. Hallelujah. So the blood of Jesus has purchased the church. So the body of Christ, the church, your local church. Firstly, you see your local church is very important to God because Jesus has purchased that church. So never disrespect the local church, even if it is a small church whatever it is, Jesus has purchased that church. Don't disrespect it. Okay. So it's very important that we honor and respect the church of God because Jesus has purchased the church of God. So wherever you see a church, that church is under God's hand and it is the church of God because Jesus has purchased it with his own blood. And that is why it's very important that we don't uh, we are very careful. We are very careful about attacking churches and ministers. 
We should be very, very careful. It's a grave sin in the eyes of God. Don't attack churches. Don't attack God's servants. Even if they're not perfect, you don't like them, leave, go somewhere else. But don't attack them because the church belongs to Jesus, is purchased by the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 5, 23 and 25, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Now, I'm not going to talk about husband-wife relationships here because that's not my subject. But what it says here, that Christ is the head of the church and he's the savior of the body. So the first thing is that Jesus is the head and the church is the body. See, if you look at the church, the church of Christ, I'm talking about the body of Christ. It has many components and I'm a part of it. And we, you know, it says that we are, we are the body of Christ and we are all members and, and uh, you know, uh, and all that. And, uh, and everybody has his own part, but he's the savior of the whole body. Hallelujah. And uh, Jesus is the head of the church. He's the head and we are the body. So Jesus, because he's the head of the body and we are uh, the parts of the body. So what happens is that the body, a healthy body, always responds to the impulses that come from the head. So like if I want to move my right arm and then I look at my right arm and I just send an impulse here. I want to move this right arm, you see. But what happens is that if I want my uh, my, uh, if I want, if my brain wants my right arm to move and my right arm doesn't move or it moves when I don't want it to move, well, that means there's something wrong with this part of the body because a healthy body always responds to the impulses of the head and it does everything that, that the head tells it to do and it doesn't move on its own when it's not told to move. So Jesus is the head of the church. He's the head. We are the body and he's the savior of the body. That means that if you have anything, if you have any disease or anything in your body, Jesus is here to save you. He is here to set you free from that situation and bring you in spirit, soul and body in life and harmony with you. Why? Because Jesus had purchased the church with his own blood. Then it says here, husband loves your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So Jesus Christ has loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus loved the church so much that he died for the church. Hallelujah. That's one reason I don't want to criticize the church. I don't want to criticize the body of Christ. I can find many faults if I look. Uh, if I look, I can find faults with the church and some people do that, but I don't want to do that. You know why? Because Jesus died for it. Jesus valued the church enough to die for it. So don't criticize your local church or the body um, because even if there's faults in it, because firstly, Jesus bought it with his own blood. And secondly, Jesus died for it. And if something, Jesus looked at something worth enough to die for, it is precious to God. And if it is precious to God, we should honor it. Amen. So, and the next point is, the blood of Jesus protects us. That was a short point. So I'm going through some short ones. The next one is that the blood of Jesus protect us. The blood of Jesus protects us. And the blood of Jesus protects us from disasters, protects us from the works of Satan, protects us from disease, protects us from death, protects us from the devil. Exodus 12, 13, it says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Hallelujah. And that was from the from the book of Exodus when God told Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. And then God told Moses that there's going to be a great disaster because you see, God had given the Egyptians many, many opportunities to actually Pharaoh. God had told Pharaoh, he had given him many, many opportunities. He said, let my people go, let my people go. And Pharaoh had always said, okay, I will let them go. But then he had turned around and rescinded his, his gone back on his word, on his promise. And finally, God had said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to strike every house in Egypt and all the firstborn in the house are going to die. Every single house, starting with Pharaoh's palace, every firstborn is going to die. And that's what's going to happen. The angel of death is going to come 
over every household in Egypt and every firstborn will be killed. And then he said to Moses, he says, you, you take the Passover lamb, take the blood of the lamb and put, apply that blood on, on the lintels and on the doorposts of your house. So Moses told the people of Israel, apply the blood of the lamb on the, uh, on the lintels and all the, on the doorposts of their house. And so, uh, and so he says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's why they called it the Passover. He says, and God says, when the angel of death comes and I look at the houses, he said, when I see the blood, I'm going to pass over you. So all the houses, uh, all the homes, every home in Egypt will be stricken. They're going to lose their firstborn, except the houses where he would see the blood. He says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So what the people of Israel did, they slaughtered the Passover lamb. They took the blood of the lamb and put it on their doorposts and put it on the lintels of their door. Then they went to sleep. And in the morning when they woke up, every other, every single household in Egypt that lost their firstborn, except the houses of the Israelites, because they had applied the blood upon their doorposts. So that's why it's called Passover, because God, the, you know, the, the angel of death passed over their houses. So the blood of Jesus protected the Israelites that day. And this is a biblical principle that the blood of Jesus protects us. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus protects us. Now, for those Israelites, it was the blood of, a, of the lamb. Now, of course, you, you got to understand in our present day context and many people around Easter time, you know what they do? They paint red on their doorposts. Listen, red paint is not blood. It's not blood. It, it's red, it's paint. Or some people even put red tapes on their doorposts. I mean, that is religious nonsense. You know, and even if you took a real lamb and killed it and took its blood and brushed it over it, it still would not protect you because Paul says, Christ is our Passover sacrificed for us. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. He shed his blood upon the cross of Calvary and his blood is available to us. So it's not a question of symbols. Listen, symbols do not save us. Symbols of the, of the, uh, you know, of that Passover uh, 4,000 years ago when Moses told them to put, you know, symbols like putting a piece of red tape or putting a piece, uh, you know, put, painting some, uh, you know, your doorpost, putting nail polish or whatever. Those things do nothing. They're just religious. And secondly, uh, you cannot, it, it, you know, there's no point in, I don't understand the value of bringing Old Testament traditions and uh, into the New Testament and then practicing those things. Because you see, those things, whatever happened in the Old Testament are types and shadows of what's in the New Testament. Because that Passover lamb was actually a type of Jesus Christ. That blood of that lamb that was applied to the doorpost as protection, that's a type and shadow of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. So Christ is our Passover. So firstly, we don't need a Passover lamb. We don't have to sacrifice a Passover lamb because we have Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when Jesus Christ was crucified and his blood ran down upon that cross and we applied that blood upon our lives by faith. And we do that not only at Passover weekend, not only at Easter time, but every single day we acknowledge that precious blood. And that's how we applied that blood. And every single day, like I do in my family, I say, Father, I thank you for the precious blood of Jesus that was shed upon us. And I, 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 I said, I cover my wife, Britta, and myself with the blood of Jesus. I cover Emmanuel and Gabriel and Victoria and Scotty and 
Annalise and even I include Scottish parents. I include our whole family. I cover them all with the precious blood of Jesus. I thank you that with through the blood of Jesus, we are protected from sickness and disease, from death, from all the works of the evil one. I thank you that our homes are protected. Our property is protected. Then I pray for my team. I thank you, Jesus, that my teams overseas, they are protected by the blood of Jesus. You see, that is how we apply that blood upon our lives, upon our families every single day. Every single day. I don't wait for Passover uh, to do it. And because you see, that is a type and shadow. So, you know, it's not a Passover. It's not an Easter thing, but it's a spiritual truth that the blood of Jesus protect us, protects us because God said, when I see the blood upon the doorpost, the angel of death will pass you. And that's a spiritual truth even today, that when we are covered with the blood of Jesus, hallelujah, we are covered with the precious blood of Jesus. Our homes, our families, our children, our grandchildren are covered with the blood of Jesus. We are protected and the devil cannot touch us. Hallelujah. So we should be applying the blood of the lamb as protection over our lives. Hallelujah. So now, the next point is the blood of Jesus breaks every curse. The blood of Jesus breaks every curse. And in Galatians 3.13, we see the scripture. It says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, the curse of the law is you find it in uh, Deuteronomy 28, where God, he tells the people the blessings of obeying the law and the curses of disobeying the law. So if you read Deuteronomy 28, it talks about the blessings in the beginning up to verse 15. Then it talks about the curses that come as a consequences of not obeying the law of God. And, and the blessings of God are prosperity, and health and life and the curses of disobeying the law are poverty, sickness and death. Those are the threefold curse of not obeying the law of God, the law of God. And it says Christ Jesus has Jesus Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. That means he has set us free from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Jesus redeemed us from the curse because he himself became a curse for us, for it is written Cursed is everyone who hangs on the trees. Talking about the cross. So when Jesus was upon the cross for us, he became a curse for us so that we can be redeemed from the curse and we can be blessed. So, you know, some people talk about curses here, there, generational curses and all that. But let me tell you, those things are real. But the thing is that Jesus has broken every curse. And when you are in Christ, your life is in Christ. Every curse over your life is broken and you don't have to wear fear any curses anymore. Otherwise, you'll be spending your whole life chasing curses because you don't know what your grandma, what your grand grandmother did, whether they were into witchcraft or whatever. And you will spend your entire life trying to chase demons and trying to be free from curses. No, the bloodline, the blood of Jesus breaks every curse. It's simple as that. And there's no teaching in the New Testament that says that even though Jesus became a curse for us and you give your life to Jesus, you still have to spend the rest of your life breaking curses. Curses were broken at Calvary. Jesus became a curse for us. And uh, uh, I, I will teach about this another time. That's another subject. We'll talk about blessings and curses. Now, in Matthew 27, 29, it says, And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and they reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. So what it says is that before Jesus crucified him, and yesterday I talked about how they whipped him, how they beat him, and they had put a crown of thorns in his head. See, it says, then they began to beat him up. And, uh, and they mocked him. They called him Hail King of the Jews. Now, uh, uh, thorns are very, are in the Bible are symbolic of the curse that is on mankind because of sin. So when Adam sinned against God, <coughs> God said, from now on this earth is cursed and it shall bear thorns and thistles. So 
thorns are symbolic that is a, of the curse that is upon mankind because of the sin of Adam. And when Jesus wore that crown that day, he bore that curse that was upon mankind upon his own self. So Jesus upon the cross, he not only bore our sins, not only bore our diseases, but he also became a curse for us. He bore those curses upon himself. So every kind of curse, that, you know, there are curses, there are generational curses. And, but the interesting thing is that about generation curses, he, you know, he says, I've, I'll visit the sins of the fathers, uh, 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 you know, upon the second and third generation. But it says, but showing mercy to those who love me. So it means that there are generational curses, but they don't apply to those who love God. So there are generational curses. Yes, they exist, but they cannot touch those who love Jesus because the moment you come to Jesus, you come under the blood, that curse is broken. Hallelujah. The curse is broken when you come to Jesus, you come under his blessing, under his cover, and he has already broken every curse and he breaks every curse that is upon you. Secondly, there are people who can put curses upon you. And, and, and you know, the word curse in the Hebrew is the word halal, and that actually means to imprecate evil upon somebody. So firstly, God never puts a curse upon you. To imprecate evil means actually to speak, uh, uh, to transfer evil upon somebody, transfer death and evil upon somebody by speaking it out. That's what it means to imprecate evil upon somebody. When you speak evil upon somebody and God never does that and God never allows that. So if somebody uh, like so I've had that, you know, witchcraft, uh, witch doctors. When I got saved, there was this famous uh, guy who was into witchcraft. My dad was one of his devotees. He spoke evil about me, over me, and he cursed me. And you know what happened? In a few months, he was dead, and I'm still alive and preaching the gospel 45 years later. So what I'm saying is that when you are in Christ, those curses are broken. It doesn't matter what people say, what people do, or how much witchcraft they do. You don't have to worry about it. You don't need to have any counter strategy about breaking those curses because those curses are broken because Jesus Christ became a blood, uh, a, you know, a curse for us and his blood protect us. So when he wore that, when he was upon that cross and his blood ran down from his wounds and when he wore that crown of thorns and that blood pour, poured from his brow, I want you to know that the blood that poured from his brow when he was wearing the crown of thorns and the blood that poured from his hands and his feet when he was upon that cross, that blood breaks every curse upon you and upon me and nobody Nobody on this earth has the power to curse that which is blessed by God. You and I are blessed and we are not cursed. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you have a curse on your life because Ephesians 1, 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every blessing in Christ in the heavenly realms. Listen, if Jesus became a curse for you upon the cross of Calvary and he wore the crown of thorns for you and he bore that curse and Ephesians 1, 3 says that God has blessed you and me with every blessing in Christ Jesus. How can anyone ever tell you that you have a curse upon you that needs to be broken? Those curses have been broken by that precious blood that flowed from his brow, that flowed from his hands and his feet. Thank God for the blood of Jesus, that the blood of Jesus breaks every curse. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I thank you that we are not cursed, but we are blessed and we are blessed with every blessing in Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that you became a curse for us so that we can walk in your blessings. And today I ask you, Father, to to touch each person, every home, Father, let them be blessed and let them be strong and serve you and bear much fruit for your glory in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, we will continue tomorrow and tomorrow we will talk about how the blood of Jesus gives us fellowship with God. God bless you. And listen, uh, a lot of people are writing to me and telling me how they are watching this uh, uh, you know, these uh, uh, Bible lessons and you know, the whole subject. Some people listen to this every day 
And so, you know, if the Lord has spoken something to you through this teaching or the Lord has touched you in any way, uh, just write to me, tell me. It's good for me to know what's happening out there uh, because many people, many people don't write. Some people uh, write to me and then some people say, oh, by the way, I've been watching you and I've been so blessed when I, and I didn't even know they were watching it. So just let me know what the Lord is doing in your life. And also, if you have prayer requests, please do send them to me because my wife and I, we get together every day. We get prayer requests. We seriously pray for them. We love you. Jesus loves you. Stay well, stay safe, and we will see you again tomorrow. God bless you.